Good evening, everyone. I, Chaitali Bagh, Chief of Bureau, Aviation and Defense Universe, welcome you all to this evening's discussion on opportunities to revive Indian Navy and Royal Navy's interaction. And our guests for this evening are two very popular naval analysts, Commodore Ranjit B. Rai and Commodore A.J. Singh. We are privileged to have you both with us here today. And we have the editor, Aviation and Defense Universe, Mrs. Sangeeta Saxena, to take this discussion forward. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Chatali. Uh, very good evening to both our naval analysts, Commodore Rai and Commodore Eiji Singh. It's just lovely to have you both here. You know, uh, Chatali, they are one of the best analysts we've got in the country now. You know, so uh, we'll begin with uh, now that, uh, you know, it's uh, DACI time. And uh, this is going to be our uh, interaction. Uh, keeping the event in mind, it's going to be on the Royal Navy and the Indian Navy connections. And with both of you, you know, there's one very good uh, point, which I think is uh, for our uh, viewers to know that uh, Commodore Ranjit Rai did his staff college at Greenwich and uh, Commodore A.J. Singh was the Naval Attaché in London. Now, who better than these two? So we begin from here, sir, and uh, the senior gets the opportunity, sir, first. So uh, Commodore Ranjit Rai, the first question goes to you. Would you be able to trace the history of ties between Royal Navy and Indian Navy? And also keeping in mind, you know, that you've been uh, on a course there. So how much do these post borders trainings, you know, they imply they're good and do we need more of them? So we begin with you, sir. I'm glad you asked me this question because the Indian Navy of today is actually the daughter Navy of the Royal Navy. The Royal Indian Navy fought in the war, well, cut its teeth. And it is so interesting to say that everything that we did in the younger days of my Navy till my middle age, ATP-1, ANSP-1, submarine exercises, or the ships we had, INS Delhi, followed by INS Mysore and Vikrant in 1961, the aircraft carrier, Seahawks, the Bs, the Type 14s, the Type 12, and all the ships that we had, including the INS Mugger, the landing ship, a base was made by the Royal Navy. So we go back. Today's generation may not uh, recall all that. So then we turned a bit to the Soviets and then we turned to the Americans. But basically, even today, the foundations of the Indian Navy are the foundations given by the Royal Navy. The pedigree begins with the Royal Navy. And we must say that today there is a connection between the Indian Navy and the Royal Navy. And I would just end by telling you that I was lucky to the history of the Indian Navy. So this book tells you from daring, uh, from dreadnought to daring, dreadnought. and Admiral Satinder Singh has recorded this in this book, 1945 to 1950. So we must know that whether it is now or ever, the basic Indian Navy, what it is today, is founded on the Royal Navy. Right, sir. So I think uh, that's given us food for thought because, uh, you know, it's been some time since we've actually given these two navies uh, importance. And, uh, you know, it's always been, you know, the U.S. Navy, the Chinese Navy, the you know, Australian Navy, the Quad coming up. So I think this is something wonderful which you've told us, sir. We'll continue with Commodore A.J. Singh. Uh, Commodore A.J. Singh, you were the naval attaché. And uh, I really would like to understand from you that what are the areas of cooperation between the two navies? You know, I think we need to look at it in two aspects. One, of course, is the operational uh, cooperation between the two navies. As Commodore Rai so eloquently said, our fundamental uh, learning has been from the Royal Navy. We are still very royal in our traditions, in our, et cetera, in the Indian Navy as well. And I think that's a good thing because I, the one thing that struck me when I was there was the institutional strength of the Royal Navy. I mean, the Royal Navy was no longer the Navy which ruled the world or, you know, or, or where the sun never set, etc. But with that small force that they had of barely 34 or 35 uh, frigate and above style ships, they were still able to maintain a global footprint from the South Atlantic to the Caribbean to the Indian Ocean 
they were everywhere so that i think speaks volumes for the institutional strength of the navy you know in the navy they say it takes 3 years to build a ship but 300 years to build a navy so that's i think what that's a big lesson we must take from the royal navy number 1 number 2 from the operational perspective there was a phase when perhaps uh, the interest of the royal navy in this part of the world waned because they were so focused on nato and the cold war etc they didn't have the numbers to focus in in the indian ocean but ever since the indo pacific has again become important we see a larger royal navy presence regularly in these waters exercise concon is alternately held either in their waters or in ours initially it used to be held only in ours subsequently when i was there we got the western fleet over to exercise in the atlantic and subsequent to that there has been a frequent presence of royal naval warships in the uh, western indian ocean we always had because they have a competent maritime competent command in bahrain but they also started coming eastwards and now with the carrier task force 21 which is deployed in the indo pacific i think now that they've got the numbers and they have the aircraft carriers i think and the global geopolitical shift to the indo pacific we will see a larger presence and the larger presence that we see of the royal navy is inevitable that a closer cooperation with the indian navy will follow both operational and otherwise uh, the second aspect which is very important in this relationship which i was focusing on when i was there was to build up an industry defense industrial relationship between the two countries that i'm afraid uh, still has some way to go for a lot of reasons we probably in the course of this conversation some of these will emerge but i think that is one area where we must focus our attention and uh, there are lots of strengths in the royal navy in the british defense industry which we must uh, uh, learn from we must adapt certain of the best practices and see how far we can take this relationship forward right sir absolutely you know because we uh, you know we have so much of uh, make it india and aatmanirbhar bharat and all happening so i think it's just a right time for the two to get together to uh, you know chalk out a uh, track for themselves uh, so from here we'll uh, go to commodore ranjit rai uh, ranjit sir would you just tell us you know we know that uh, there have been uh, training uh, of naval aviation pilots on the british hawks now are there is there scope for more such trainings for this arm as well as the other arms well uh you ask for areas of cooperation and you rightly i mean an officer has now come into the india fusion center but you know i did my uh, long navigation uh, aviation control training the fighter controller with the royal navy so i have a very soft spot for what we are doing with the phi and the power of the indian navy in the air uh so i see the first position of cooperation we are flying the hawk for training our pilots we are going to need many many more pilots and unfortunately uh, we got the uh, the uh, swiss aircraft for training it didn't work out we stopped production of the hawk aircraft and now we've got the new aircraft carrier uh, 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 the grand coming out next year we will need more and more training so the hawk in atmanirbhar actually can begin another project of making hawks in india for both the air force and the indian navy because every aircraft after a 15 year period needs a new model and needs a new interior so i can see that with monetization of india the and atman nirbhar the thinking cap is up to the british unfortunately when we had cooperation with the royal navy unfortunately they were tied to united states of america and we could not get support for our seekings and unfortunately relations from that day did not go so well but today we are in a very good position with the british india relationship getting to new heights so i see that if both nations can put on their thinking caps there is opportunity of cooperation between the royal navy the indian navy the british industry and the indian industry of course aj singh will be talk about the submarine projects because we are going to go more into nuclear submarines and we had initially our training was done with the royal navy and maybe in our future nuclear submarines in the long term defense takes time to fructify aj singh may be able to comment on that as a very experienced submariner so can we continue commodore ajay from here as to what uh, commodore ranjit rai just said 
So what is your uh, take on this uh, submarines uh, becoming a very major part of cooperation? You know, the Royal Navy is now only a, is an all-nuclear Navy. It does not have any conventional submarines. So obviously, when it was where, where conventional submarines were concerned, we really had very little uh, in common to really learn from them or cooperate with them. However, now that we are going down the uh, nuclear attack submarine route with the government having approved construction, indigenous construction of six SSNs, I think we should, uh, we should definitely be talking to the Royal Navy. They have a lot of experience in operating SSNs. Uh, they've got the astute class, which, is amongst, which are amongst the most modern SSNs in the world. They have seven of them which have recently entered service. Uh, uh, some of their uh, technologies, you know, some of their companies like Real Rolls Royce and Babcock have been in this game for the last 50 or 60 years. So I'm sure there is room for uh, discussion. There is room for uh, cooperation. And I hope uh, at the appropriate level, these things are going to be discussed. Now that we have a British UK India roadmap for the next 10 years of, and a relationship which is just short of or is almost on par with being a comprehensive strategic relationship. I think we should be looking at industrial cooperation a lot more in a lot more areas. So also, uh, I mean, just in continuation to what you were saying, I wanted to understand that anti-submarine warfare, is that also, uh, you know, is, is, do you see some scope in that for uh, Indian and uh, British ties? Uh, anti-submarine warfare is part of a larger whole. There was a British sonar on the on the Sea Kings, and you know we were we were using that. Uh, at the moment, we don't have too much British equipment with the Indian Navy, but as a Commodore Rye right in the beginning said, our entire training, our entire operational philosophy has been based on Allied publications. Whether it was the ANSB, whether it was the ANMI, whether it was the uh, ATP three, these are all tactical publications, NATO tactical publications, on which we also learned and cut our teeth. So I think there is a lot of scope for. And that, I think, is where Konkan comes in, you know, where, the, where we see interoperability between the two navies. We go to them, they learn from us, we learn from them. We've got a lot to teach. We are operating in a far more operational environment uh, in our part of the world than perhaps they are. And so I think you're right, there is a lot of room for improvement and cooperation across the entire spectrum of uh, exchanging operational expertise between our two navies, definitely. Right, so uh, Ranjit sir, uh, I you know, just wanted to know from you, uh, we, we have an international liaison officer who's now posted, you mentioned him also, in the center in Gurgaon. Can you tell us a little more about the center and why uh, this cooperation? Well, the, the world's center of gravity has moved east and it's moved into the Indian Ocean. It's moved to South China Sea. And therefore, we must have the plot for all friendly navies to know exactly which ship is where and what is happening so that shove comes to push, we will immediately be able to cooperate. So the fusion center has actually got the picture of all the ships. And now I believe the 21 countries are cooperating. Six foreign liaison officers are there. Lloyd's shipping gives you the help to track a merchant ship. The Indian Navy can track the AIS of all ships. We have a surveillance system. So that is, of course, something of cooperation in the nature of friendly relations and defense for anybody. But I'll just go back a little back to say that did you know that BAE systems, aircraft, helped to finish the grip Gripen? It modernized the Gripen and it made it an export market got it to export market. Now, there we are with our LCA. The Navy has actually landed their LCA on an aircraft carrier. But for the last stage of our production and exports, I'm a great believer of exports since I was a defense attaché in Singapore and got gun, the 155 gun to be tested in India. We sent trucks to Philippines. You know, we need a foreign partner for exports. Pardon me saying so. There's no better exporter. It's not as big as America, but a British exporter knows what to do. Right, I, I just add, also, the BAE, once we come in, we are doing a cooperation with them. Uh, oh, uh, we, we've got British, uh, uh, you know, uh, laser, laser gyros. We've got equipment from uh, companies in Britain, but they're all small. We have to now think big and export. And there is a market available for export. And I just heard 
that the ACMA and the LCA Mark II are going to be, well, LCA Mark II will be rolled out next year. The ACMA, the Advanced Combat Aircraft, and one for the Navy, they are all talking. But you know, the cutting edge that India needs is in the final finish of that aircraft to make it weaponized. And I think there, there is scope for cooperation. The Americans are expensive. The American dealings are more tricky. Of course, it is the FMS system, but the British were always there. And I'm sure we are all looking for business. Right, sir. Sir, taking off from uh, your point, Commodore AJ, I just wanted to understand that, you know, it's a uh, ease of business in India is a very big issue. Now, a uh, transfer of technology and with Atmanirbhar Bharat and Lake in India. So, I mean, how do you see that uh, will this indigenization program uh, attract attention from the British manufacturers? Or, uh, you know, we need to make things easier than uh, what they are today? You know, the first thing I think if British industry really wants to come into India and make a mark, it has a lot of catching up to do. We have got a very close and, uh, you know, a very close industrial relationship with countries like the US, Russia, Israel, France. So UK comes a distant, is distantly behind them. So they will have to make that effort. I know it's not easy to do business in India, but it's not easy to do business in India for anybody. It's not only for the Britishers. So I think they will have to walk that extra mile. They have shown the enthusiasm. Uh, the industrial relationship hasn't really taken off. In fact, the British High Commissioner at a recent interaction even called it underwhelming, which, you know, was, uh, which is actually true. Why it hasn't happened is, is very difficult to say because, uh, you know, British equipment is good. Uh, in certain areas, they have got cutting edge technology, cutting edge technology that India is looking for. So I think that is that is one area we must be clear that the British should be willing to share that technology with us. I think they've been a little reticent in the past about sharing technology. There are still issues. I know on autonomous systems which are, in which they're very strong. In fact, today, just this afternoon, I was reading an article on how there's a new concept of complete fleet going autonomous. So that's huge, you know, even though it's a concept study at the moment. They've got autonomous under surface vehicles. India is just entering the autonomous uh, uh, domain in, in terms of naval capability. So I think there is a lot of room for India to interact with Britain, for Britain to support Indian industry in developing these technologies. But there has been, and I, I brought this up earlier also uh, with, with somebody, that there has been a hesitation on the part of Britain to share cutting edge technology with India. They're not very willing to export, whether it's... Uh, they're suspicious of our past association with the Russians or what the reason for that is, I don't know, but they have been a little reticent. And I think they will have to get over that if they really want to make a breakthrough. Otherwise, these countries which have already stolen a march over them will continue to do so. Uh, and, and Britain will have a lot of catching up to do then. Right, absolutely. One, one yeah, area, yes, uh, sorry, I'll just, one area I think where we must encourage uh, Indo-British defense cooperation is in the area of the MSMEs. Indian MSMEs are second to none in the world. They unfortunately do not have the bandwidth to project themselves at international exhibitions, etc. It is the Indian, uh, whether it's the Ministry of Defense or the industry associations, that must expose them to international markets like DSEI is a great example. You know what the British do at DSEI? They take every, what they do is they organize a coffee morning for their, with their MSMEs. So they will take the Indian delegation. Uh, let's say 10 MSMEs are keen to do business in India. Those 10 MSMEs are hosting a coffee morning just for the Indian delegation for one hour. So they have, without spending much money, except for a cup of coffee and probably some sandwiches, they have the Indian delegation captive for one hour to put forth their point of view, their equipment, what they want to sell. That, that's something that the British government facilitates. And that is exactly what we should be doing. We should be taking some of our MSMEs to international exhibitions. We should expose them. We have to handhold them initially for them to make that mark. Because they have to, we have to get our MSMEs into the global supply chain of big companies like BA Systems, or Rolls Royce, or any of these big British uh, industrial houses. So this is a food for thought for the Indian MOD to organize such coffee mornings at Def Expo at Gandhi Nagar next year, sir, for the Indian MSMEs and uh, Brit uh, the British delegation. That's a great idea, sir. Absolutely. So, uh, Ranjitji, taking off from here, uh, you know, I just wanted to understand there is a big word uh, nowadays in uh, military parlance, interoperability. 
now with the waters of uh, you know indian ocean slightly turbulent and of course the south china sea very turbulent so where does this interoperability uh, stand between the two navies royal navy and indian navy well uh, before i answer that i certainly agree with uh, uh, aj the dsci exhibition is the biggest in exhibition where we can learn a lot of what's happening in the world if we keep our eyes and ears open and just not again go back to the drdo and what india produces because we know that very well and we have to ferret and cooperate possibly in the long term on intelligence therefore it takes me of course to the south china sea um it is a troubled period in india with what has happened in afghanistan and even our prime minister today while speaking at another function at aligarh was talking of afghanistan these are challenges the uh, british have done the most william darampal and others have done the most uh, uh, challenging work on afghanistan the british went away and south china sea uh, well till the court uh, makes up its mind what it is it's just a talk show it is capable of taking and is going to put pressure on china uh, we have to cooperate with the british because they understand the indian navy very well we can possibly operate because now the queen elizabeth came operated with us how much we can have learned because it's produced a 65000 ton aircraft carrier which india will be looking for and you know even designing an aircraft vikram carrier vikram took a lot of challenge and therefore it was delayed next aircraft carrier we certainly can get from uk because uk and royal navy and france actually designed it together designing takes a lot of time and if you go like we went for the ariane with a de- design from ruben we got a transfer of technology from uh, dcn we can look at that and of course the chai chana sea is a sensitive subject a lot of intelligence and what goes behind the scenes is important but indian navy and royal navy can see themselves operating together like we do with the american navy with less uh, practice and that's my view cooperation cooperation and we must cooperate with a maritime power which britain still is right sir sir uh, continuing with commodore ajay singh uh, commodore ajay singh you are a submariner and uh, just wanted to understand you know that uh, our strength uh, combined with the royal navy strength uh, does it it doesn't look formidable uh, in, in case of any contingency in our waters <laughs> you know i firstly i don't think that we are ever going to reach a situation where the two navies will be uh, pitted together against a common adversary in an actual operation scenario and that's a bit uh, you know that's way into the future if it ever happens yeah <laughs> it is a little difficult to visualize but coming back and this relates to your your question about interoperability i think that is something navies have like minded navies have to continuously exercise with each other to develop interoperability because when the time comes and i'm not talking about a war but there are many many the maritime security scenarios traditional non traditional threats when navies have to operate together in an in a hostile scenario that practice of interoperability will stand them in very good stead it is not something that you can create overnight and i think towards that uh, we already have a we have the advantage of a common language we have a, we have the advantage of a lot of common procedures between our two navies in fact uh, when we did the first uh, tabletop exercise in uh, portsmouth with the indian navy with the western fleet the one remark that the first sea lord who came for the last debrief said was i have never seen such a close understanding between two navies when they are working together otherwise there's a language gap or there's a perception gap or there's a op- operational concept gap but he says here the two navies which seem to be in perfect sync on how they react to everything so that is something we must build on as far as interoperability goes and i understand that now india's close to signing a logistics agreement with the with the with the, with the uk now when that happens that is the first step that means you'll be operating a lot more together we'll be sharing a lot of things together on the logistic front and may lead to more such agreements subsequently like it happened with the americans the lemo was the first one to be signed there was a lot of hesitation on the others but they did follow sooner or later they did follow i think what needs to be done one of the areas which i think uh, the indo uk defense relationship really has to build up on is more exchange at a higher level also you know we haven't had it i can't remember when was the last time an indian defense minister visited the uk i know it's not happened in the last 15 years at least so on the one hand you're talking about this 10 year road map and 
comprehensive strategic relationship, etc. But if you don't have a defense minister visiting that country for 15 years or, or maybe longer, then there is a gap which needs to be bridged. And I think reaching this 10-year roadmap, we should now be looking at taking that relationship to a 2 plus 2 level. If you've got 2 plus 2 with Australia, US, France, and all other like-minded nations in the Indo-Pacific, and Britain being an integral part of the Indo-Pacific, and now willing to integrate itself into the uh, security architecture of this region, I think it's important that we elevate our relationship also. Maybe it might happen in a year or two to a 2 plus 2 level. Uh, which, which takes me to the next question, which is for both of you. Is there a will missing from the government to, uh, you know, take the ties ahead to, you know, it, it's a very simple thing. The defense, I mean, I was going to ask you about defense production, but now I'm going to ask you about everything. So is there a will missing from the government or uh, it's just that nobody's ever thought about it? No, I don't think we, frankly speaking, I don't think we approach the UK with the same enthusiasm we approach, let's say, the US at the moment, or France for that matter. Uh, okay. It's nice, we have a good relationship. And it's sad that even our high commissioners to the UK and their high commissioners to India have often spoken about uh, that this, this relationship is not realizing its full potential. Now, where that gap is or why that perception persists, I really don't know. It's happening at a high level. And that's why I said it's very important that high-level defense cooperation or high-level interaction at a senior level, in the min at the minister level or at the secretary level, a lot more needs to be done, I think. Uh, it's right. nice to say that we have, a, we have a very vibrant diaspora there. They are becoming more and more politically aware. We have lots of people in the House of Lords and the House of Commons. But if we have to build on that, then we need to do more. Definitely Absolutely. more. Absolutely. Absolutely. Ranjit sir, what would you like to add on to that? You know, since I thought the question could be put to both of you. Well, all I can say is the DSCI is coming up. You've covered from what we can cooperate, what we can uh, get Britain to help us with exports. Because I think there should be a lot of accent on that. And there should be a roadmap, as AJ said, said that he has served in the High Commission there. At the higher level, he's quite right. We hope there is a cooperation on that aspect and both are able to talk to each other in the same language because uh, there is possibility software export from India. And of course, BAE is already doing work in India. And as I said, there is uh, gaps which they can fill up to weaponize our aircraft, uh, the LCA. They have got the experience. They've done it with Gripen. BAE has the experience. And so that's what I could look forward to with Britain. And AJ has covered the gamut. Of course, we cannot go together to face another thing, but we must be together just in case. And they did that with piracy. With piracy, they set up in Dubai a maritime uh, structure by which we were able to cooperate and therefore bring to end piracy in the Gulf of uh, Aden. Right, sir. I think uh, I'd really like to thank both of you. It's been wonderful to have you both on the show. And, uh, you know, I, I, this is first in the series. We'll continue, sir. So uh, next time it could be another Navy with the Indian Navy. And uh, looking forward to, you know, uh, having lots and lots of more such evenings to be put onto the ADU video section, which looks forward to such things. And the audience will be very happy. You're both very popular gentlemen, you know. So <laughs> I'll now hand, hand over to Chitali. Thank you so much, sirs, for coming over. And now it's over to Chitali now. Thank, Thank you, Sangeeta. so much. Thank you pleasure. so much, sir. It was such an intriguing amalgamation of uh, history with the present scenario. And of course, we talked about future so much. And with the backdrop of DSEI, actually from both of you, after hearing both of you, I feel I mean, I have missed a lot from if that I, didn't, I could not go to DSEI. But of course, the COVID, but um, surely next time I'll definitely, definitely try to go to DSA. Yeah? Otherwise, I'll miss a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, sirs. Uh, hope to have these kind of sessions in future more. And thank, um, you, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Right. Okay, Chatali. Bye from here then. Bye. See Ships you. ahoy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Bye. Absolutely. Right, sir. Have a nice okay. evening ahead, all of you. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.